יד בן צבי אינסטיטיוט. And now to, to the keynote address. I have the honor to invite later Professor Noam Stillman, not Norman. Professor Noam Stillman has directed the Judaic Studies program at the University of Oklahoma since the program began. He has written many books and articles ranging from the studies of the Jews of Sefru, a small city in Morocco, to the broader studies of North African history and languages. Over the last quarter century, he has focused his scholarships on Jewish-Arab encounters in Arabic lands, and he is currently completed a book on Jews in North Africa in the, 20s, in the 19th and the 20th century. Recently, he also published one of the late Yedidia Stillman two unfinished book, Arab Dress, a short history from the dawn of Islam to modern time. And he is at work on the other unfinished project, a massive encyclopedia of Arab Dress. He is the, chief ed the editor in chief of the Encyclopedia of the Jews of the Islamic World. He received the Distinguished Humanist Award for the year 2000 from Ohio State Univ uh, University. Professor Stillman Noam, if I may, is a teacher, he is a colleague, and he is a very dear friend. And the subject of his lecture will be Touched by the Winds of the War, Middle Eastern Jewry during World War II. Noam, please. Good morning. Thank you, Chaim. Thank you, one and all. I must, I must say, um, it's a particular pleasure for me to be here once again in the famous Tzrif. Um, nearly 50 years ago, um, I took part in my first international conference here, um, which was on the Jews of North Africa. Um, it was the first time I ever gave a lecture in French. Um, re uh, Rahel Yanait Ben Svi was still alive. There were many people from France, and at that time, French scholars did not uh, did not um, particularly like English. Um, and I was and I was I was young and wanted them to get to know me. Um, but in the questions and answers, spoke in Hebrew, and she came up to me afterwards and berated me. If you speak Hebrew, why didn't you give the lecture in Hebrew? <laughs> so I, I did. Ex I did explain to her, and then of course. Uh, one of the, you mentioned the book on Sifru, that was actually written um, primarily with a grant from the Bensvi Institute. So I, I have a, a great bond uh, with this place. Now, the Second World War was traumatic for Middle Eastern Jewry, uh, as indeed it was for all Jews worldwide. And although untouched directly by the physical horrors of the Holocaust, with a few notable exceptions, and these were primarily, as uh, my colleague Chaim Saadun noted, in the Maghreb, which was a more active theater of war, but outside the parameters of this conference, the chilling winds of war did in fact touch them, one and all, to a greater or a lesser degree. The war would have a transformational effect upon the Jews of the Middle East and the wider Islamic world, and contributed greatly to their sense of solidarity and common destiny with the rest of the Jewish people. Jews in Arab lands, and I'll be really concentrate, I won't be talking about Iran uh, or uh, Turkey, which uh, there are, uh, there is at least one, uh, one paper I saw dealing, uh, dealing with Turkey. But the Jews in the Arab lands, which, which I know best, were well aware of the fact that many Arab nationalists admired German and Italian militarism, men such as the Ba'ath ideologue Michel Aflaq, the pan-Syrian nationalist Antun Saada, and members of the Iraqi military and political elite exhibited an intense Germanophilia, to use Bassam Tibi's apt expression. In the decade leading up to the Second World War, Mein Kampf, in Arabic translations, multiple translations, usually with the anti-Arab passages carefully expurgated, circulated throughout the Middle East, and was also serialized in some newspapers. Paramilitary Arab nationalist youth groups 
such as the Qumsan al Khadra, the green shirts of Misr al Fatat, al Qumsan al Hadidiya, the iron shirts of the Syrian national bloc, the Kata'ib, the phalanxes of the Ikhwan al Muslimun, the Muslim Brotherhood, the Futuwa, and the Muthanna Club in Iraq, all of these consciously imitated Nazi and fascist models. In addition to their uniforms, their martial displays, their cult of the leader, and a propensity for violence, many of these groups openly espoused, especially after the Palestinian Arab general strike and revolt of 1936 to 1939, the Judeophobic rhetoric of their European heroes. Thus, Ahmed Hussein, the founder and leader of Misr al-Fatat, Young Egypt, could write in the movement's journal, Jaridat Misr al-Fatat, they, that is the Jews, are the secret of this moral desolation which has become general throughout the Arab and Islamic world. They are the secret of this cultural squalor and these filthy arts. They are the secret of this religious and moral decay to the point that it is correct to say search for the Jew behind every depravity. On the eve of the Second World War tensions between Jews and the surrounding population were mounting everywhere in the Arab world. There was a rash of sabotage incidents aimed at Jewish private and communal property in Iraq, in Syria, Lebanon, and Egypt in the two years just prior to the war. The primary factor in these rising tensions was, of course, the conflict in Palestine. The appeals of the Mufti Hajj Amin al husseini and his envoys for Arab and Islamic solidarity in the struggle against imperialism and Zionism struck resonant chords in much of the Arab world, which was still under either outright colonial rule or some form of European tutelage. And indeed, the conflict between Jews and Arabs in Palestine was, in the words of the uh, Polish historian Lukasz Hershowitz, quote, as if made to order for the needs and aims of Nazi propaganda, end quote. At the war's outbreak, the outward manifestations of anti-Jewish hostility were initially suppressed by the authorities. In Egypt, for example, a state of emergency was declared and martial law and strict censorship were introduced. However, Egypt's careful neutrality until almost the very end of the conflict, the nearness of Rommel's Afrika Corps during, the 19, during 1941 and 42, and the continued sympathy for Germans among Egyptian nationalists chafing under the strong British presence gave Egyptian Jews genuine cause for anxiety. King Farouk himself had conveyed his, quote, high respect and support and that of a 90% majority of his people, end quote, to the Führer. It was the massive presence of British troops in Egypt, the very presence that was a thorn in the side of nationalists, that was in fact the only real guarantee of the Egyptian Jewish community's continued safety. And this guarantee was by no means assured until the rout of Rommel's uh, uh, forces at El Alamein in November 1942. Prior to the British victory, thousands of Egyptian Jews, along with many other members of the large foreign community, fled from Alexandria, which was the closest to El Alamein. I should note here that only about a third of Egyptian Jewry actually held Egyptian citizenship. Over a fifth held foreign passports, many going back to the days uh, of the, uh, of, the uh, protege, of the protégés, and nearly half were listed as other in the official census records, and many of these latter were actually stateless persons. Many of those who fled Alexandria transferred to Cairo, although many there fled as well. Others, including those who were known to have been active in Zionist or anti-fascist activities, and the Jewish community in Egypt was perhaps the boldest of the Middle Eastern communities in the years before the war in opposing uh, anti-Semitism and fascism. Many of these were temporarily evacuated to Palestine. And the assurances of Prime Minister Mustafa an nahas the Pasha, who had been installed several months earlier with the backing of British tanks, 
to Chief, Haim, uh, Chief Rabbi Chaim Nahum in July 1942, when an invasion seemed imminent, he told him that even if the Germans succeeded in invading the country, Egypt would not institute anti-Jewish measures. Such assurances did little to assuage communal Jewish fears. Egyptian Jews also had considerable cause for concern because in addition to the nationalist and Islamist pro-German sympathies, there was a widespread popular belief that Jewish businessmen were profiteering from the war. It was commonly believed among the hard-pressed Egyptian masses who had to face a 300% rise in the cost of living during the war years that the Jews were, in the words of a British embassy report on this sentiment, quote, mainly responsible for shortages and high prices of essentials of life, end quote. German and Italian propaganda, of course, capitalized upon these sentiments and portrayed the Jews of Egypt as acting as British agents to deprive people of food supplies in favor of themselves and the British troops. The Jews in Syria and Lebanon were briefly touched even more directly than their brethren in Egypt by the war, although they too came through relatively unharmed. For almost a year between July 1940 and June 1941, Syro-Lebanese Jewry found itself under Vichy rule. Shortly after the establishment of the Pétain regime, a delegation of Jewish communal leaders in Beirut, headed by Joseph Farhi, petitioned the French High Commissioner, Gabriel Puyot, who had been in o that office since before the war, not to apply Vichy anti-Jewish legislation in greater Syria. Puyot, of course, as a civil servant, could not accede to their request. However, he was not an enthusiastic supporter of Vichy, in marked contrast to the French authorities in North Africa, especially those in Algeria and it appears that he did not do his utmost <coughs> to implement Vichy directives. His replacement in December 1940, General Henri Dentz, although a loyal servant of the Vichy regime, and, la and later, by the way, convicted as an Axis collaborator, was too occupied with the deteriorating internal economic and political situation in the Levant states, and as of 1941, with the Allied invasion, to single out the small unobtrusive Jewish minority for attention. The Jews primarily suffered from the severe shortages of food and fuel with the rest of the pop urban population through the winter and spring of 1940 and 41. The Syrian Jews had additional cause for concern on account of the active presence of German agents who were in open contact with Arab nationalists and finding ready listeners to their propaganda among the masses who believed that an Axis victory would bring them independence at long last. A popular children's ditty celebrated the coming time when there would be Bala Monsieur, Bala Mister, Fissama Allah, Wal Ard Hitler. No more Monsieur, no more Mister, God in heaven and on earth Hitler. Nazi anti-Semitic tropes and paraphrases of Nazi anti-Semitic literature remained, unfortunately, standard fare in Syrian publications for many decades following the war, practically up to, the mod to modern times. Indeed, the Jews' sense of relief in the Levant states was greatly tempered when the Allies handed a uh, landed uh, um, uh, handed Lebanon and Syria over to the Free French in the summer of 1941 because of General Catrou's uh, proclamation the very morning of the invasion promising the two mandatory territories would finally be granted independence. Although it would be more than two years before the Free French began to make good on that promise, many young Jews, especially in Syria, concluded that there was no future for them there and began turning toward neighboring Palestine. Several thousand crossed the then porous border into the Galilee, either on their own or with the help of soldiers from the Yishuv in the British Army, as well as with the assistance of the Damascus branch of the Hehalutz organization. The Jewish community of Iraq was not nearly so fortunate 
as those in Egypt and the Levant states in escaping outright physical harm. Iraqi Jewry's wartime experience had more in common with the Jewish communities in North Africa. Even before the war, Iraqi Jewry, which was conspicuous because of its overall numbers, in fact, it was by far the largest Jewish community uh, in the Middle East and was uh, of the size similar to that of Tunisia and Algeria, so the, the very, very large community. So its overall numbers, its prosperity, and its disproportionate prominence in the commercial and professional uh, uh, life uh, of Baghdad had been subject to threats and invectives emanating not only from extreme nationalist elements in the press and political opposition groups, but from within official state institutions as well. Thus, for example, under Dr. Sami Shaukat, a high official in the Iraqi Ministry of Education and for a while its director general, fanatic statism on the Nazi model, heavily imbued with anti-Semitism, was inculcated in the Iraqi school system, often by Syrian and Palestinian teachers. In fact, in one of Shaukat's addresses to educators, he branded Jews as the enemy from within, who should be treated accordingly, and in another he praised Hitler and Mussolini for making the eradication of their internal enemies, that is the Jews, a, co a cornerstone of their own national revivals. And this tone of anti-Jewish agitation in Iraq was raised even further after the arrival of the Mufti, Hajj Amin al husseini in Baghdad in 1940, escaping from uh, British justice after the Arab revolt in Palestine. The position of the Iraqi Jewish community became exceedingly precarious on April 1st, 1941, when a pro-Nazi military coup toppled the pro-British government uh, of Prime Minister Taha al-Hashimi and, and forced the Hashemite regent, Abdelilah, and the royal family to flee the country. The new government of Rashid Ali al-Ghalani was backed by the army, the Palestinian Mufti, in whose home, by the way, the conspirators had planned the coup and sworn allegiance to one another, the Pan-Arabists, and indeed most of the uh, Iraqi people. Some of the leading members of the new regime, such as Yunus al-Sab'awi, were rabid Jew baiters, and during the two months that the Rashid Ali government remained in power, Nazi propaganda in Iraq was at its zenith. One of the cardinal pr uh, points of this propaganda was that the British and the Jews were allies. Thus, when Iraq entered into open hostilities with Great Britain in May 1941, the Jews were regarded by much of the Iraqi population as a fifth column. Throughout the 30 days war between Iraq and Great Britain, the Jews of Baghdad were subject to all sorts of harassment and, and intimidation. Paramilitary youth groups, such as the Futuwa and the Kataib al-Shabaab, the youth phalanxes, roamed the streets of the capital, arresting individual Jews whom they accused of signaling the enemy, sometimes executing the suspects on the spot. Members of the military or civilian authorities made various attempts to exhort contributions from the war, uh, for the war effort from the Jewish bourgeoisie. And there were several threats of anti-Jewish mob violence. In one such incident, which occurred on May 7th, an angry crowd broke into the Meir Elias Jewish hospital and accused the patients of signaling enemy airplanes. Only the prompt intervention of the police averted any serious harm. Yet despite the mounting tensions, the periodic harassment, and the presence of Fritz Grobe, the Reich's senior representative in the Arab world during the final month of the Rashid Ali regime, the Jewish community of Baghdad, which constituted half of all Iraqi Jewry, over 60,000 uh, Jews in Baghdad alone, experienced no real misfortune. And ironically, disaster struck at the very moment when the Jews thought that deliverance was at hand. On Thursday, May 29, 1941, as British troops from the south approached the outskirts of Baghdad, the four colonels who had staged the coup 
Rashid Ali and his close associates, and the Mufti, together with his followers, all fled the country. Rashid Ali and the Mufti eventually reached Berlin, where they worked on behalf of the German war effort. A three-man council for internal security, headed by the mayor of Baghdad, was left behind as a transitional government. Yunus Asabawi, who remained in Baghdad, summoned Rabbi Sassoon Khadori, the president of the Jewish Community Council, and ordered him to inform his people that they were to remain in their homes for the next three days and to refrain from using the telephone or, communing, or communicating with one another in any way. At the same time, Asabawi prepared an incendiary speech for broadcast on the radio later that day, calling for an uprising that would, among other things, purge Baghdad of the enemy from within. However, before this could be done, Asabawi was arrested by the Council for Internal Security and expelled forthwith from the country. The council also dissolved the paramilitary groups, including Asabawi's national force, the al quwa Asabawiya uh, al wataniya and ordered them to turn in their weapons to the authorities, which they did not do. The Jewish community was now convinced that the danger had passed, and on Sunday, June the 1st, the first day of the Feast of Shavuot, which Iraqi Jews traditionally marked by joyous pilgrimages to the tombs of holy men and visits to friends and family, the Hashemite regent Abdelilah returned to the capital from exile in Transjordan. A festive crowd crossed over to the west bank of the Tigris to welcome the returning prince. On the way back, a group of soldiers who had only been recently defeated by the British troops, and these were soon joined by civilians, turned on the Jews, killing one and injuring others, while both the civil and the military police looked on and did nothing. Anti-Jewish rioting soon spread throughout the city, especially on the east bank of the Tigris, where most Baghdadi Jews lived. By nightfall, a major pogrom was underway, led by soldiers, paramilitary youth gangs, and followed by crowds of men, women, and children from the urban masses. The rampage of murder and rapine in the Jewish neighborhoods and business districts continued until the afternoon of the following day, when finally the regent gave orders for the police to fire upon the rioters, and Kurdish troops were brought in from the north to maintain order. The British army, which had been encamped at the, on the outskirts of Baghdad the entire time, could easily have suppressed the Farhud, the name given by uh, Jews to this pogrom, and the, wor the word um, uh, is uh, more or less akin to, uh, to fitna in standard Arabic, that is a, a murderous breakdown of law and order. But the British troops refrained from entering the city because they did not want to give the appearance that the regent, who was friendly to England, was returning to power with the help of British arms. As Somerset de Cher, an intelligence officer with the British forces, ruefully observes in his memoir, ah yes, but the prestige of our regent would have suffered. In the Farhud, 179 Jews of both sexes and all ages were killed, and some 2,000 were reported injured. 242 children were left orphans, 586 businesses were looted, and 911 buildings housing more than 12,000 people were pillaged. The total property loss was estimated by the Jewish community's own investigating committee to be approximately 680,000 pounds, and the Iraqi pound was tied to the, at the time to the pound sterling, with some estimates ranging as high as four times that amount. An Iraqi governmental commission of inquiry appointed immediately after the incident advanced considerably lower casualty statistics However, one of its members, Abd al-Razak al-Hassani, later acknowledged that the government desired that the figures be minimized. None of the other smaller Jewish communities of Iraq experienced such a disaster. In Basra, 
only cases of looting were reported, and that was uh, uh, no worse, that it was no worse was in part due to the local Muslim notable who organized a militia to restore order and help to protect Jewish life and property. Nevertheless, the Farhud dramatically undermined the confidence of all Iraqi Jewry, and like the Assyrian massacres of 1933, in the very first year of Iraq's independence, uh, there was a massacre of uh, uh, Assyrian Christian villagers uh, in the north. It had a highly unsettling effect upon all Iraqi minorities. In the immediate aftermath of the pogrom, the British consular authorities received over 1,000 visa applications from Iraqi Jewish merchants for India, ostensibly for commercial reasons, but clearly in order to seek refuge since they applied to take their families with them. In a secret note, the Foreign Office in London pointed out that Iraqi Jews had good reason for alarm and asked the local consular officials to consider the applications seriously. But the consular authorities in Iraq denied most of the applications on the grounds that many more would apply if visas were granted too freely. The same period saw an increase in clandestine emigration from Iraq to Palestine. American intelligence reports of the OSS, the forerunner of the CIA, estimate the number at circa 1,000. The Jews in the Middle East uh, suffered no mass roundups as had taken place in Cyrenaica. There were no internment or forced labor camps as in Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco. Nor were there effective Aryanization laws expelling Jews from the professions as in the French Maghreb or confiscating Jewish businesses and in, as in Algeria to any great extent. Even in the Levant states, which were also for a time under Vichy rule. Only in Iraq did the Jewish community suffer over two brief but terrible days the kind of physical harm to life and property that was beyond anything experienced in the Maghreb and was more akin to the pogroms of Eastern Europe. But until the tide of war had turned, Middle Eastern Jewry was well aware of the omnipresent threat posed by a German invasion in the case of Egypt or the actual presence of a pro-Nazi, anti-Semitic regime in the case of Iraq. It was also all too aware of the anti-Zionist and anti-Jewish animus of Arab and Islamic nationalists, which was kept in check only by the strict wartime controls that were put in place by the British and the Free French authorities. And indeed, at the war's end in 1945, there was a wave of anti-Jewish violence in Egypt, Libya, and Syria. And within just a few short years, most of the Middle Eastern Arab countries would lose the overwhelming majority of their Jewish population. These Jews had for the most part felt the winds of war, if not the war itself, but they felt its threatening chill nonetheless. And if we are to take the metaphor of the shadow of the Holocaust from the title of this conference as a synecdoche for Jewish wartime experience, then they too were caught up in its long, dark shadow. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Stillman, for your comprehensive lecture. Please.
Okay, you can answer, Professor Stillman. Mr. Van Hood had inspiration from Nazi propaganda, and that, I don't think anyone would, would deny that. Um, Iraq, Iraq was very much influenced uh, by the Nazis. If you, if, if, if you read, uh, for example, Schaukatz uh, published his, his, his lectures to teachers, you see, it, it's uh, highly, it's, uh, and of course, Kolba, before he had come back uh, in May of 19, in May of 1941 uh, to Baghdad, but before that, he had been ambassador in, uh, in Iraq. Um, of, course, of course, they were very, very much influenced by it. You read, you read uh, for example, some of the memoirs of some of the nationalists, um, and they also say how much they were influenced by this. So that was it a Nazi was it a Nazi event that that is no it was not it was not Germans doing this but these were people who admired who admired them uh, tremend tremendously and of course you had his his presence there the Mufti's presence there so um, it cer it's certainly uh, it's, its importance in Iraq and among Arab nationalists generally um, can't be it can't be denied as for the Vichy, as for the Vichy regime, was it, was it, uh, the Vichy regime in part didn't need uh, the Nazis. If they were, there were, if there were, if there were people within it who were quite anti-Semitic. And in fact, especially of course, some of the, uh, the individuals from, uh, from um, Algeria, like Admiral Darwin, um, and who was for a while in the Vichy government then becomes the viceroy uh, of all uh, of all North Africa, of all North Africa. Um, and again, Paxton uh, and Maru uh, and Maru. Uh, Maru. Maru. Maris, yes, thank you. Uh, uh, Maris and, and I think it's Maris and Paxton actually <laughs> for the book. Um, uh, they point out that the Vichy regime instituted many of its anti-Semitic Aryanization laws before the Nazis did in occupied. France. The Nazis had held back for a few months because they, did, they weren't sure that, that they, could, they could do it so easily there. And Vichy took the lead actually in doing it. Um, as, for, as for the Levant states, for Syria and Lebanon, um, it's clear that, as again, you all uh, was not, he was, he, was, he was a loyal civil servant, uh, but he was, not, he was not an enthusiastic supporter uh, of, Vichy, of Vichy, and Dents, who was a loyal uh, uh, Vichy's, uh, he simply had so many problems on his hands that they couldn't, they couldn't do what was being done uh, in, uh, much more effectively uh, in, Al particularly Algeria, which remember, Algeria was not a colony, it was part of France. Um, uh, and in the case of Tunisia, uh, again, Tunisia was able, you have a fair proportion of people who had obtained French citizenship. Uh, so there they could, they could implement the Aryanization laws more easily. In Morocco, uh, they could have Jews leave from, uh, from uh, the European quarters, uh, but most Moroccan Jews didn't have French citizenship and therefore were not subject uh, uh, to the worst of Haitian laws. Thank you. One more question, please. Yes, please, Professor yes. Mahmoud. Yeah. Uh, just a short question regarding Egypt. Uh, you said that truly it is clear <coughs> that uh, the admiration for uh, Nazism and Francism in, in, in uh, um, Arab uh, movements in, uh, in Egypt has been overemphasized and played a little bit down. That is your evaluation. <laughs> First, I have to say I'm a great admirer of my friend. Um, but I do, but I do think um, that it has not been overplayed. Um, if you read, if you read the publications of whether it's Mr. Al-Fatah or of the Ikhwan uh, and so on, um, they were very much influenced by this. Uh, it's not as uh, widespread, perhaps, as you would find 
in Syria and Iraq. Uh, I mean, you, there, we really, you really, really see it. Um, but that was the center of Arab nationalism. And Egypt, Egypt had, 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 did have, to a certain extent, a separate, a separate identity. I think it was King Abdullah the first of Jordan who had the famous statement, al Arab al or Masr, Masr, uh, that the Arabs are Arabs, but Egypt is Egypt. Uh, and there is a certain relation to that. No more questions? So thank you very much, Professor Stillman. Thank you very much. The opening session is ended. I'm calling to the other uh, lecture to come to the